Hey beautiful, how you doing tonight? Welcome back to Lucky After Dark. Woohoo! And if this is your first time joining us, please make sure you hit subscribe. But otherwise, let's just get going. So, a lot of you probably don't know this or don't believe this, but officers actually mess around with the gay guys too. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. First of all, I didn't know about this, my damn self, to be honest with you. When I first got locked up, I thought that it was very, very clear. The way that the, the way that media and just what you see and what you hear, you would think that there is a clear divide, which there should be. I'm not saying that there shouldn't be, but you, you know, you, it gives you the impression that there's obviously a clear, you know, separation between the officers, the correctional officers that work at the prison, and the inmates, the prisoners that are actually housed at the prison. But that is not what honestly happens. And there's a couple reasons why. For one, the inmates that are there benefit from getting close with the officers. Because if you can get friendly with an officer, you are more likely to be able to get stuff, contraband, smuggled into the facility. Things such as drugs, cell phones, you know, and whatever else, really. But those are the main things. Like, drugs and cell phone is really what people are after these days. But, you know, you can get other stuff, too. Maybe even some weapons. But I don't really see it really going that far. I think that mainly, uh, especially a correctional officer, they might be interested in getting a inmate a cell phone. But what the correctional officer would benefit from, like linking up with a, a inmate would primarily be actually drugs actually for real and the reason being is because of the pay wage first of all how it even happens in the first place is that correctional officers they don't have a regular job like other people do they don't just work five days a week for eight hours at a time they usually work five or six days a week for 12 hours at a time that is a huge difference there's a lot of officers that I had met correctional officers that I had met while I was in there that they felt like they were actually serving time because over the course of 18 years 20 years that you didn't have this job like you spent a majority of your life actually inside the prison and they have to go through the same type of uh, uh, procedures i guess like codes conducts as a lot of the inmates do they're searched when they come in they're searched when they leave out they have to wait for like permission in order to go to certain areas it's the same as like an inmate it's just that they have the communication to radio somebody and just be like open the door or they might they might you know, get a pass on how they're being searched or something like that just because, you know, they know the officer or something. But even inmates, like, a lot of the officers are lazy anyway, and they really don't be interested in looking at everybody's penis all the time or touching them. You have some perverts in there where people, a lot of straight guys, even some of the gay guys, they'd be like, oh, frisk me. Or the the regular straight guys, they'd be like, you know, yeah, I see you trying to, would you trying to play with me or something? You know what I mean? Like, so sometimes, like, they don't even feel like doing the most or whatever. But my point is that the the lifestyle of an officer and a prisoner over time can seem very similar and that gives them a common bond sometimes where it it actually can happen for the officer because I think that listening you probably would be like well I can see where an inmate would definitely want to be friendly with an officer but I don't see the benefit of why an officer would actually want to be friendly with an inmate and there is a benefit one they get lonely just as much as the prisoner because they are spending 12 hours a day there you know, just at work all the time, even just on a human level, the curiosity, I, I think, you know, you are interested, some, some people actually do see the inmates, thankfully, actually, in a thankful way, actually, they do see them as people and are just curious, like, how did you end up here? Why are you here? And then even on a professional level, then other times I think it can happen innocently, just trying to do your job, know thy enemy, know the enemy, you know what I'm saying? Like, the more that you kind of can actually get to know the inmates and, you know, how their day today goes and, you know, the way they think, you can be a step ahead of the person when shit goes down, when something bad happens or something like that. But over time, 
just that that basic connection it can actually go someplace different it can actually take take a turn in a different direction so it does happen is my point for any of the naysayers that just flat out don't believe it it does happen there are a lot of guys that definitely want to get close with the female CEOs and they constantly flirt with the female CEOs all the time because just sometimes purely for the conversation it was like that even with me being gay like there were some guys I thought that everybody just trying to sleep with me and 90 freaking nine percent of them were but the other one percent it's like I'm kidding it was I guess probably less than that the the other percentage however much it was they just a lot of them after a while, I started to realize they did just want the conversation, if that's all they can get. Like, just the attention was good enough. Because even what we're doing right now, just like uh, having a, an intellectually stimulating conversation, I hope that this is intellectually stimulating, but just having like a real conversation, that's something that just, even something as simple as that, it doesn't really happen in prison. It does, it just doesn't. Because the people don't want to be there people don't care about the next person because you're aware that you're surrounded by criminals, you're surrounded by crazy folk, you know, just people messed up in the head. So people have no interest in talking to people. And something that actually becomes very common is everyone, nobody talks to you for no reason. And it's actually a very corrupted thing that happens because that messes up your social skills for when you come back out actually it took me a minute to kind of adjust and i'm still working on that to be honest with you but you know because out here you can come across people that just take an interest in you or just have no motives behind you know talking to you or something like that that is something that does not exist in prison any person that is speaking to somebody else there is a reason always, always behind it because it's a survival situation. So there's some advantage to you that the person sees or maybe wants, which is why they are talking to you, period, period. It don't matter who you are and whether you're gay or straight, an officer or an inmate, period. There's, there's a reason behind every interaction. So it does happen. Now, some examples of where I personally experienced it and personally had seen it is, first of all, with the transgender female that I was housed with. I was housed with someone that I refer to as Katrina, and she really knew her, her shit. She knew how to work people. She thrived off of it, and she enjoyed doing it. Like She, she loved having people like pawns, I guess you could say. This person is good for me for this, this person is good for me for that. She would have like a husband who she lives with and that's her man. And then she would have pieces is what like the community calls them in prison. Pieces are a guy, a couple of guys that you might have conversations with, like just entertain just in general, or maybe you give them a hand job, maybe you give them a blow job or something like that. They're aware that you're not with them. Like they might feel some sense of possession over you or something like that. But if you know how to keep all of that under control, and sometimes it gets hard to keep that under control, it can be to the queen's advantage. I was not, it just wasn't for me because I don't know how to do that kind of stuff. Like, you know, emotions always go crazy. And I'm just not also interested in really putting myself out there, like, in that kind of way. But there were plenty of queens that do and did it well, you know. And it branches all out from inmates into officers as well. This queen that, I'm just, that I was just telling you about, at the other prison she was at, she had an officer that she was messing around with, and he used to bring her in. She told me hair relaxer. That's where I first kind of got interested, where I was like, oh my gosh, an uh, officer can bring you in that? She's like, yes, girl. Like, why don't you, what is the, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't they? You know what I mean? Like, if you're pleasuring them, like, they're going to bring you stuff, you know? This is just the way that she thought. This is just the way that she thought. But he would get her, like, hair relaxer. She had a cell phone. Her books was good, and I seen the receipt. She had three grand on her books, and it was, I guess, accumulated over time, but it was from, her mama wasn't sending that. It was from the guys, and probably from the CO. And taking it back, speaking of 
uh, she, I don't, she wasn't really big on drugs, but when people would give her stuff, she would usually resell things. The Her drug of choice was usually, like, weed. She used to like to smoke marijuana. But any other kind of stuff, she would take all gifts, you know, and she would just resell them to people. And that's another reason why uh, an officer would also kind of, like, pair up with an uh, inmate is because they really don't get paid. To be working 12-hour shifts, six days a week, their checks are probably like $900, maybe $1,100, maybe, honestly, every two weeks. And, you know, state facilities actually pay the correctional officers more than private facilities. At least this is what I've heard several times. And it it's very clear from what I witnessed, too, because when I was at the private facility, it was like a revolving door, like clockwork. Every two or three months, there would be a whole wave of new COs that are being trained all over again. Every It's like that now. I, I, I have someone that is still locked up, Cam. I've mentioned him several times on this channel. And he tells me about, you know times where new officers are being trained he'll be locked down because that's another talk that's another sign of new officers because or not having enough officers is because you're locked down like if there's not enough officers working you're locked down but anyway for those type of sh long shifts that they're working they ain't getting really that much but they can smuggle in like you know half an ounce of weed or whatever and a feezy in prison a feezy that's like half the size of a joint goes for like eight dollars the profit on that is Three times what you would make out here, you know, and then they split that with the uh, officer. That is really a hustle. That is legitimately a hustle, you know. So, it definitely happens. There was another queen. Katrina is the transgender that I had met at the state facility when I first got locked up. When I was transferred to the private facility, there was another queen that I refer to a lot of times in my prison diaries as... Nene, and she was like the compound coordinator. She felt like she literally worked at the prison, and the officers actually treated her like she worked at the prison, and she really had a lot of freedom of movement and a lot of influence on just the, the staff in general, and she was messing around with the supervisor, the, what was he, he was the health department like correctional officer slash supervisor of that you know it was just a small division you know like a little office or whatever but she had a desk next to his an inmate this is an inmate and by the way a child molester at that t too like her charges she's in there for child pornography but this is how her deal which that's a separate video sex offenders i will talk about that in a sec in a separate video of how sex offenders are actually treated. Not good, to cut it short, but where she lucked out is because she was a queen. She was, you know, I t try to tell y'all, people don't want to be honest about the gay community, but they, a lot of times, they actually be running shit more than people want to admit. For real, for real, for real. And prior to gang members, nowadays, gang members have no problem sticking shit up their ass in order to smuggle stuff in because they don't want to talk to the homosexuals. It's strange how things have gotten backwards. Out here, it's more accepted, I guess, homosexuality. And in there, it's less accepted. But it used to be the opposite. Out here, there was it wasn't accepted at all. And in there, from what I've heard from like you know old timers, it used to be even more accepted because the queens were the ones that did all of that stuff. They were the ones, obviously, since they like taking it up the butt, they were the ones that smuggled shit up their butt, and nobody else was doing it then in those days. But times have kind of like changed. But still, in all, this is where she had lucked out because she takes hormones and all of these things. And she, on the outside, she used to actually kind of be like an educator, believe it or not. Well, obviously, if you're doing child pornography, I guess you would work in some capacity with children, sad, sadly. But so watch the adults that work around your kids, people, watch them. But uh, yeah, she used to work in that kind of capacity and that's how she was able to kind of like maneuver her way into the administration as an inmate. But also it worked to her advantage that she was in fact sleeping with the dude. She was sleeping and that's not even the rest of the list, <laughs> honey. She was sleeping with the supervisor of the health 
safety, I think is what it was, the unit manager for the building that she lived in, she was sleeping with him, and he actually used to like to mess around with a couple of the queens, he like had a reputation on the low, I guess you could say, of messing around with the queens, and she was his number one fave, you know, just because she was just loose, and, and, you know, did it, uh, like, literally on demand, like, on demand, you know, you ask, like, hey, I'm trying to get some head, and she'd just be like, okay, when, you know what I mean, right now, you know, like, that, she was that kind of type of hoe, you know, and people, it, it did her well, it definitely worked out to her favor, because the bitch was literally running shit, and even during, like, shakedowns, her cell would not even be shook down, and, uh, she could leave because she worked like, you know, as like a safety office person, as like some sort of coordinator of something or whatever. So she'd be able to still come and go and do her job and go, you know, work in the office with the safety dude, even during the compound lockdowns, you know. Then my own personal, there's other, like there's tons of heterosexual stories where I knew or had heard of other inmates that were in there messing around with the girls. A lot of, I've seen a lot of female COs walked off the compound, meaning that they were fired. And the guys, they now locked up in the hole. And me personally, my own uh, experiences, the first time was when I had just gotten locked up and I went to, actually there's a couple of times now that I think about it. When Before I even got to prison, I was in receiving and there was this officer that he used to give me trays all the time. He would give me extra trays, is what I mean. Like, for breakfast, I had two trays. For lunch, I would have two trays. And for dinner, sometimes, I would have two trays. Because he, maybe he would make an arrangement with, like, somebody else or something if he couldn't give it to me himself. And he used to love to ask me to sing Purple Rain. A couple times he wanted me to, you know, do some silliness or something like that. But I didn't mind because I was getting two trays. And all the guys were hating, like, in receiving because they were all getting one tray and I'm getting two and like this is the thing that be pissing me off about these prison channels on YouTube I'd be thinking like y'all y'all scared motherfuckers just don't even want to really be telling the truth now you know what I mean like actually to be honest with you I'll give them credit that they just don't talk on the subject at all because it's the people who haven't done time that are miss like informed you know of what it actually is for a gay person in prison the people who have done time they know the deal even if you wasn't like a part of what was going on the culture or whatever but you bared witness to it the ha the homosexuals got it they we had it i had this guy bringing me two trays and nobody else was getting two trays i wasn't even doing anything with the guy i didn't even flash him i was good for flashing somebody in my butt when i was in <laughs> prison not all the time but sometimes but i didn't even you know i just got to prison like i'm not i'm scared at this point like i'm not trying to you know get in more trouble, like, I'm trying to get out of here, you know, uh, but I definitely was friendly and flirty and all of these things and, you know, in a comfortable way, but then when I did get to prison, the first place that I was at was a state facility for five months, I was only there, and there was an officer one time, I was trying to give him, like, a request form or something, they had, like, a booth in the center of the pod, and it had, like, a little envelope slot where you could walk up and ask them for things or hand them something or, or whatever, and they, they, the glass booth was, like, literally in the center where they could see into this pod and see into the other pod, and when I walked up to hand him the request form, he was just, like, uh... He, he was cute, he was definitely very cute, this white guy, he kind of looked like, uh... The guy from Princess Bride, there's like this old movie, Princess Bride. Oh, and also Robin Hood, Men in Tights. Um, cute white guy, just your run-of-the-mill average Joe, you know, perfectly good-looking white guy, you know. But he was an officer, a correctional officer. But when I'm asking him for the request form, he's like, uh, oh yeah, um, he's like, yeah, and I saw you in, heading to the shower, you know, yesterday or something like that, you know, and I was kind of caught off guard because my first thought was like, 
what did I do? Like, why are you watching me? You know what I mean? Like, what did I do? You know? But I'm like, oh, yeah. And then he's like, yeah, I just had to make sure you was all right. You know? You know, like to keep an eye on people, make sure that nobody, you know, bothering anybody or anything like that. And that's when I kind of, like, realized, I'm like, oh, he's flirting with me. I think. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, okay, you know, thanks or whatever. And I just kind of, like, laughed. And that was it, you know? That's why I never even wrote about this in my journal, actually. Because it, it was really nothing, you know? And I was scared to death to talk to any COs. And then later, there were a couple other times. It's starting to rain, so I apologize about the noise. But later, there were a couple other times where uh, I would be heading out to the rec yard or coming in or something. And maybe he's the guard that's, like, doing the pat-downs as you're walking in. Pat-downs are where they just, like, check you before you go back into the building. And he would, you know slowly do it with me or something you know whatever just silly things and I just smile and laugh or something but I didn't really send him any signals so it just never really went anywhere and then plus also at this point at this compound I was moving a lot of the time like I was moving from this cell to this cell this part to that part so it was short-lived anyway when I got to the other facility, the private facility where I spent the bulk of my time and the rest of my time, there was another officer that I did actually flash my my ass to. <laughs> I tried to make it look like I just, I was in the cell by myself at the time, and I knew that he was going to be doing a round, like a, a CO check round at night while we were already locked down. And since I'm in the cell by myself, I was trying to make it appear like I sleep with no underwear on or something like that. And I just, I hope my brother is not watching this, by the way. But I, <laughs> if you are, bro, thank you for your support. <laughs> but I tried to make it look like I just, you know, sleep with no underwear on. And I just happened to kind of, like, fall out of the blanket. Like, the blanket just kind of, you know, is pulled you know what I mean like I'm just showing but it's like accidentally like I had my back to the to the door and you know just kind of like sticking out you know what I mean just I'm um, just poking my behind out and the blanket is like hugging my hip you know what I'm saying like innocent looking he walks past with the flashlight and then doubles back with the flashlight and just holds it there you know and then he keeps on moving and um that was a big mistake because definitely don't get me wrong we had flirted with each other and the night, that night, as a matter of fact, we had, we, he came in and he was just standing around for a minute. He used to, he was somebody that liked to talk to a lot of the inmates, another white guy actually. And <laughs> he came in that night and we talked for like 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes. Everybody in the pod was watching us talk. Like they definitely were curious, I guess, like, you know what we was talking about. And I didn't talk to too many people anyway, so I guess they definitely were like, you know, oh my gosh, he talking to the CEO, what he what is going on here kind of thing. And after I did that, later I get into the relationship with Cam. Obviously I'm in love with Cam and I'm very committed to Cam. I'm not interested in doing anything with anybody anymore. And he was still trying to be friendly, but he ends up really like trying to attack Cam, like just spreading rumors with the inmates, which was crazy. Cam couldn't believe that an officer is actually doing this, like spreading rumors and stuff. Then he would go back. There was somebody else that I used to deal with. I mentioned him in my prison diaries. For those of you that have watched the prison diaries, boss, my, my prison sugar daddy, uh, that I used to have, he goes, he was chummy with boss, but I, I've said in those videos, those prison diary videos that boss was somebody who was cool with everybody like the the inmates the administration whoever and this was somebody he definitely was cool with. he was going back and trying to tell him all these crazy stories about him so i ended up having to actually go to the unit manager of the building and be like oh i feel like this uh co is trying to target me because i'm a homosexual and all this stuff and i feel uncomfortable and i don't know if i need to call priya or whatever <laughs> priya is the prison rape elimination act and uh, she handled it. She actually made it so that he was not allowed to work in that building anymore, like in our building. So yeah, the gays have power. And yes, the officers do mess around with the gays plenty of times. Plenty of times, you know? So 
There you have it. <laughs> oh, shit. We've been talking 24 minutes. My bad. Y'all have a great night. And I hope that you check out the Prison Diaries. I, if you want to hear just more of my personal experience, I got a little sneak peek book. You know, the link is in the description. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you in the next Lucky After Dark video. Love you guys. Bye.